Rainbow Six Siege has been one of those few games that started off with a subpar launch and a small player base before exploding in popularity. And we've been playing since the very beginning. And we gotta give credit to Ubisoft for taking a concept and a game with good groundwork and really listening to its community to build a more stable and balanced competitive shooter that you can play at this moment in 2019. Rainbow Six Year 4 is about to launch and this game today is not at all like the same game that it was in 2015. And while this style of gameplay might not be for everyone, could the massive changes that have happened to this game more recently make this game the right fit for you? Let's get into it. Rainbow Six Siege is a tactical team-based shooter that pits two asymmetrical teams of five against each other in a methodical close quarter combat operation. Players must use strategy and communication to pick off enemy players and complete mission objectives using various operators, weapons, and gadgets. Players on the attacking side of the game must pick their operator carefully that will best help their team move into a facility and hold an assault against the defending team where they must breach and clear an objective or pick off each operator one by one. At the start of the round, the attackers will have a set period of time to use drones to gather intel, such as which operators they are facing, where the objective is, and what traps to look out for. After that, the team must coordinate an attack by breaching and deconstructing barriers, flushing out enemies, and taking the objective. At the end of each round, players switch sides and the team that was attacking begin the defending portion of the operation. Once again, players must choose between a selection of defensive operators to best fortify their objective and prevent the attacking team from completing their mission. This can be done either by holding out until the timer runs out or by killing the entire attacking team. Defensive operators must reinforce walls, set up perimeters and traps to prevent the attacking team from completing their objective. At the start of each game, a different game type is chosen between three options, secure the area, bomb, and hostage. These game types significantly impact the style of gameplay for both attacking and defending sides. Secure the area has defending operators trying to reinforce and prevent the attacking team just from entering a specific room. The attacking team will be given a set amount of time to breach and clear the room from the defending team. If the attacking team can enter the room and stay in the room for a set amount of time without any living defending operators in the objective, the attackers will win. Bomb takes on a similar approach to games like Search and Destroy and Call of Duty, where the attacking team must plant a diffuser in one of two different bomb sites and prevent the defending team from destroying the diffuser. The defenders must prevent the attacking team from entering and planting the bomb on either one of the sites or destroy the diffuser before the bombs are diffused. And then there's Hostage. The defending team must secure a room with a hostage inside of it and prevent the attacking team from entering and extracting the hostage from the site. The attacking team will have a limited amount of time to enter and clear the room, while making sure not to kill the hostage in the process, extract the hostage, and escape from the facility before the defenders can stop the extraction. One of the biggest functions of the game is that each player must select a character to play as from a pool of 23 operators on defense and 23 operators on attack. Each operator has their own unique ability that can benefit your team or your own gameplay style. Understanding what each of your operators do is a huge importance to the game, as some operators work better on certain maps, and some operators work better only in certain game types. Being aware of these functions can be crucial, especially in ranked gameplay, when you need to predict what sort of operators the enemy team may use, and which operator can best counter their strategies. But each operator has their own strength that they can bring to the table. Operators like Ash, Sledge, and Buck are great operators for entering objectives and opening new entrances like non-reinforced walls and windows. Montang, Blitz, and Blackbeard are great for pushing on objectives and taking point while they hide behind their shields. Nomad, Capitao, Twitch, and Fuse have all abilities focused around weapons like air jabs, fire arrows, shock drones, and cluster charges that help flush out enemies from rooms and corners, leaving them vulnerable to attacks and objectives 
open the flanks. Ying, Thatcher, Zofia are mostly support characters that can help the team with entering a room with their flashbangs, concussion grenades, or EMPs, while also holding their own if needed. And characters like Thermite, Hibana, and Maverick are built to breach or burn through reinforced walls either stealthily or really loudly. We also have operators like Dokubi, Lion, and Jackal who are great for countering roaming defenders since their abilities reveal the position of enemy players and Finca and Glass are both unique in their own ways. Finca can overcharge teammates before entering a room or revive teammates across the map, while Glass can hold sight lines from a distance and hold visibility through smoke. That's until Ubisoft patches him, that is. And then there's IQ! She has a good gun. Flipping sides to the defensive side of the game, the whole focus is keeping enemies out of an objective. Operators like Kaid, Bandit, and Mute are great for reinforcing your reinforced walls by disabling the ability for operators to hard breach while also slowing down other offensive moves by being able to disable enemy drones. Capcan, Legion, and Frost are trap operators that use their abilities to damage or disable attackers upon entering a room. Ella, Pulse, Vigil, and Caviera are roaming operators that excel when staying off of the objective and run flank routes on attackers from different angles and directions. Mirror, Castle, Jaeger, and Smoke are great for limiting the attacker's options for entering an objective and which angles the attackers can utilize, while also leaving them vulnerable for flanks or surprise attacks. Rook and Doc are strong support characters that utilize either armor for your teammate or the ability to heal your teammates respectively. Echo, Valkyrie, and Maestro all utilize different cameras and drones that can be used to reveal attacker positions and in some cases serve as a distraction or hindrance that can give players crucial opportunities to attack. And then Alibi is a unique operator that uses holograms to confuse enemies while also reveal the location. There's still operators like Tachanka who is clearly the best operator in the entire game and other operators like Clash who are just garbo. Whichever operator you end up picking has their own pros and cons in picking the character. For every ability that sounds really amazing, there is a counter on the other side against it. The real strategy comes in in knowing when to use your abilities and when not to use your abilities. And then every character has access to recruit in both attack and defense where he can use any gun from any operator and is well equipped with different equipment. However, he doesn't have any special ability and cannot have attachments on his weapons. And he also has less reinforcements for walls than regular operators. But he is a good operator to use if you wanna try out a specific gun before purchasing a new operator. And these are just the first set of operators. We'll talk more about this a little bit later in the video, but we do expect to see eight brand new operators released throughout this next year, which will completely change the game with each new character. The core of Rainbow Six Siege is definitely placed in the competitive multiplayer. There is a really steep learning curve in this game, and not a lot of people can jump right in and excel. There's a lot to learn, but fortunately the game is set up in a way where new players can learn the ropes relatively relatively quickly and evolve as a player the more that they play. Situations is the game mode that they have instead of a single player, where Rainbow Six places new players in short missions where they can kind of learn the basics of movement and breaching and defending. Using regular multiplayer maps, players must tactically complete various objectives with different operators with a very loose story kind of connecting it all together. Once completing situations, it's encouraged that players jump into terror terrorist hunt, which allows you to team up with other players and practice an assault on regular maps, but against AIs instead of real players. The game mode is great for learning as the AI is much slower than real players, but there's a ton of enemies inside of the facility, which gives you quite a bit of practice. And then, after all of that, you can jump into regular multiplayer. Going into regular multiplayer, the real part of the game, there's two different types of standard play, casual and ranked. Casual is a great place to really try out the game and play all of the different maps, while ranked play is much more competitive and toxic with games that are much longer than a standard casual game. Ranked has its benefits, however. Usually, you have more focused teammates, more chances to turn the game around if you're losing, and you are more likely to play with players inside your own skill level. There are six different tiers of ranks, 
copper, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and diamond, and it can be really fun trying to improve season to season, but also pretty heartbreaking when you get stuck with bad teammates. Ranked is better once you get a group together, and for the most part, you can find decent people in the casual lobbies who are willing to team up with you and go into ranked. The map selection in this game is pretty great for an FPS. There's a large variety of really interesting settings that keep each map completely unique in its own way. You can go from breaching a simple suburban house to defending a hostage on Air Force One. Some of the settings are really interesting ideas that would almost put the map selection on par with some of the great FPS shooters from back in the day, like Modern Warfare 2. But unlike Modern Warfare 2 maps, many of these maps have a central compound and a large open outside area to leave tons of options for an assault, while also giving multiple pathways indoors since each round in the game moves you to a new room or set of rooms in the facility. Map burnout is one of the slowest in any FPS game we've ever played, as each game type has its own room utilized for an objective. And with such a large pool of maps, each experience is unique. Sure, this makes the learning curve a bit steeper as it does take much longer to learn the maps, but once you get through that initial learning phase, there is a lot that you can do. If you're looking for a more consistent style of gameplay, or you're a competitive fan hoping to jump right into it, Ranked uses a smaller pool of maps than the regular casual playlist. If you play strictly Ranked, you will miss out on some really fun casual maps, but playing on a smaller rotation helps you learn the main maps faster. While most of the maps are generally well designed, Ubisoft keeps the maps pretty up to date based on statistics of winning and losing for each map. On a semi-regular basis, maps will get removed from ranked and locked exclusively in casual. It's kind of a shame though because sometimes Ubisoft will make an amazing beautiful new map like Tower and then they go ahead and remove it because they realize the map was too big and confusing and unbalanced in favor of the defenders. So sure, it's good that they're pragmatic that they've made a bad decision and they're focused on the community health of the game, but we wish they were a little quick to fix and balance maps in the same manner that they do with operators. Ubisoft got quite a bit of criticism when they first started removing map favorites like Favela and Yacht completely from the game due to exploits. However, almost all of the maps they removed from the game have been added back into casual playlists, so they're still playable. More recently, Ubisoft decided to focus on fixing some of the maps in the form of map buffs and map reworks. A map buff adds a few rooms, changes doors and walls to help balance the map and rotation points, where a map rework completely overhauls the map style and the rooms inside, and is almost like a brand new map. While development on Rainbow Six Siege officially started in early 2013, the game is technically a spiritual successor to the cancelled Rainbow Six Patriots. Not many elements from Patriots made it into Siege. There is a basic feel and some similar style choices in both games. After a development of two years and a few delays, the game was finally released in December of 2015 and has been updated a ton of times with new maps, operators, balancing changes, and much more. Even last year in February 2013, Ubisoft announced that there were no plans to make a direct sequel for the game and that they plan to support the game for the next 10 years or so. So where we currently are at the game right now between the end of season 3 and the start of season 4, we're looking into seeing a bunch of new operators, maps, and more content to be added to the game not just this year but for many years to come. Since the release of Rainbow Six Siege, there was a new season pass introduced with each year that could give you content for a specific year and would be available for purchase all throughout the season. The passes consist of four operations, with each operation lasting three months. Every new operation, for the most part, introduces two new operators and one new map or a map rework, which at the end of the year adds up to eight new operators that you'll unlock as they come out. Right now, you can pre-purchase the year four pass for around $30 that gives you access to some cosmetics, discounts, and all the new operators coming out in 2019. You don't need to buy the season pass to play on the new map maps though, and you will also get the chance to unlock the new operators without
without it. You just have to save up a lot of renown, which is the in-game currency that you earn through playing. Sometimes there would be a different event though, like during Operation Chimera, when they introduced a zombie-like game mode that was only available for a limited time, but it was free for everyone to play. And it was really cool. There's essentially three different versions of this game for PC, Xbox One, and PS4, with the PC players having the option to buy an additional starter edition, which we'll talk about in just a second. First, you have the option to buy the standard edition for around $25. That includes the 20 base operators that originally released with the game. Then you have the option to buy the gold edition, which on top of the 20 base operator includes all eight operators from the most recent year for around $50. And then you could buy the complete edition, which includes all the operators that have been released so far for around $100. Now, as we mentioned, there is a starter edition available for $15 on the PC. This one only includes six operators from the base set of characters, which will give you three random defensive operators and three random attack operators, and they're just randomly selected. With the starter edition, it will take you longer to unlock new operators since they cost more renown. And while this is a really good addition for new players who just want to see if they like the game, there's sadly no option to upgrade later on to one of the other editions, which means you either have to grind harder forever to get the operators you want, or flat out buy the new operators with real money. Or you can just buy the game again in the edition that you want. It's not really a smooth transition, but to unlock a regular base character from the starter edition, it's going to take you about three to four days of playing for a couple hours a day, or if you want to unlock some of the DLC characters, it's probably going to take you about a week to play. Nonetheless, you can purchase a season pass even with the starter edition to get all of the characters that come from a season pass. On the console, we recommend you buy the starter edition and at the very most buy the new season 4 pass since you'll be able to unlock the year 1 to 3 operators easily throughout playing. It should take around 1 to 2 weeks to unlock a new character on the standard edition. On the PC, it's a little bit harder for us to make a good recommendation. The starter edition is a really good concept and it's just $15, so you can experience every game mode, every map, and really learn a base set of characters before having access to all of the characters, but we do really wish there was that option later on to upgrade to the standard edition for like $10 or $20. If you aren't 100% sure if this game's for you, go ahead and pick up the starter edition and just be aware of what we said and really focus on learning those base six characters that they give you. If you think this is a game that you could just put hours and hours into and you're fans of tactical shooters like maybe Call of Duty Search and Destroy, then go ahead and get the standard edition and once again go ahead and pick up the year four season pass so you get some new operators coming in as you're unlocking the old ones too. This game did eventually introduce a pretty in-depth cosmetic system as well, which is pretty unique compared to a lot of other games in this genre. Every time you play a game, either in casual or ranked, your odds of winning what they call an alpha pack increases. And every time you win a game, you get a chance to spin the wheel and you may or may not win an alpha pack. The more that you lose, your percentages go up and eventually you will win an alpha pack. While the system is really cool and it's a nice way to get some free cosmetics that normally cost money, it is definitely a shame that a lot of the time you can get cosmetics for operators that you don't even have. It just kind of takes something away from people who maybe are newer to the game and they're unlocking all these cosmetics for operators that they don't have and the cosmetics that they really do want cost a lot of money. Some of the skins on the Rainbow Six store are ridiculously priced. 20, 25,000 renown for a skin is ridiculous. That's like two weeks of grinding just to have your operator look a certain way. Of course, they're trying to get you to pay money to get the skin you want, but even some of the skins are really, really overpriced. The new Elite skins that were introduced just a few years ago look really cool, but they cost almost $20 per skin just to make your operator look cool. If you're a hardcore fan of the game, sure, you can go ahead and purchase this for a character, but overall, I'm pretty disappointed with just how expensive the store is in Rainbow Six Siege. Even as a player who puts a ton of hours in, I'm very limited to what skins and weapon skins I can get for my operators. But at this point, I'm really nitpicking at the game because it's just such a minor thing as it's cosmetic only. I'm not gonna complain because cosmetics in this game don't affect the gameplay. And for the most part, 
Rainbow Six takes a lot of pride in keeping the game balanced and making sure all the microtransactions are mostly for cosmetic changes outside of purchasing operators. But since Ubisoft has done such a good job at keeping all of the operators balanced, with a few exceptions, this game really does not feel like a pay to win game. Even though it looks like it could be, or on paper it easily could appear to feel pay to win or look pay to win, when you get into the game and you realize how the attacking and the defending operators counter each other, it really does not feel pay to win and it feels much more strategic. So should you buy Rainbow Six in 2019 with year four coming up? Absolutely. This is easily one of my favorite games I have played in a long time. We've been playing since the very beginning of this game's release back in 2015 and we've seen the game grow and we've seen the game change and honestly the more release as they do and as time gets on the game just keeps getting better and better and this stands true for both the console versions of the game and the PC versions of the game I have both of them I've switched to PC exclusively but I got into it on the console back in the day but anyways that's it for today if you enjoyed this video hit the subscribe button we cover all things video games we have a pretty big emphasis on Xbox so if you like these types of videos be sure to subscribe turn notifications on and we'll see you all next time with a brand new video